Let's take our Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 44. Psalm 44. I was saved when I was 22 years old. I was at a state university studying phys ed. I liked sports. I uh, had gone to work at Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. That's where I hailed from, or hailed from. And um, I was going to RIT taking architectural drafting. And I saw a guy that had been at a drafting board for 40 years, and I didn't want to look like that after 40 years, <laughs> all hunched over, you know, drawing lines on a board, you know. So I resigned and went to school for physical education. I played three sports a year in high school, college, and, and I enjoy sports. But in my junior year, uh, a beautiful young lady invited me to go to a Bible-believing church, and I went there and for the first time heard a clear-cut presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was in September of 1972. I went back on to school, and uh, it was in January of 1973 that I went forward in a church just like this. There was a, a man by the name of Sherman Boudreau who was one of the deacons in the church. I went forward, knelt. He came and said, you know for sure if you died today, you are going to heaven. And the way I was living, that was a reality, the dying part, not going to heaven. And um, he took a Bible and shared the gospel with me. And uh, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. God changes. Now, that not only includes everybody that's lived a wicked life, but it includes politicians as well. Some. No, I'm kidding. But it includes politicians as well. So we're to be the light on the hill. I appreciate Brother Armstrong's book. If you don't have it, get it. Don't only get it for your library, but read it about a shepherd on the hill. They need a shepherd as well. Like everybody else, uh, they're lost as far as that. But sometimes you wonder, and you that have been in the ministry many years, the fact is you wonder how you got in this deep or this far and everything else, Brother Armstrong as well, and what he does and his salvation experience. I, I, I'm reminded of the, um, uh, the, uh, the king, and you've heard the story, and again, that's another one I like to tell and like to hear it tell, told, uh, about the king, that he enjoyed competition with his, all his men in his kingdom. And so um, he had all kinds of different competition. One time he called them all down to the moat that was around his castle, and they were all standing there. And he said to the men that were standing there, he said, listen, we're competition today is this. The fellow can swim across this moat and get to the other side before everybody else. He'll, he'll get the choice of one of, three, or one of three choices. Either he can have half my kingdom, um, in property, or he can have my throne when I'm gone, or he can have my daughter's hand in marriage. And so he said, now, you got to understand, you got to swim across the moat, but I need to tell you that I filled it with all types of carnivorous creatures. You know, there's alligators and crocodiles and everything else in there that the likelihood of you making a cross is slim to none. And so he said, the person that gets across, makes a choice, half the kingdom, my throne, or my daughter's hand in marriage. And as soon as he got done saying it, boy, there was a splash in the water. Everybody turned around, this guy's swimming across the moat. I mean, he looks like a motorboat. I mean, he's just wailing and flailing to get across. Everybody felt like there's no way they could even possibly catch up with him. And so they all went to the drawbridge, got on the other side, waited for him to come up out of the water, comes up out of the water, and the, coach, the king says, I, I would have never guessed anybody had been able to do that, never in a million years. He says, well, he says, what, what do you choose? He said, you want half my kingdom and property? And the fellow's got his hands on his knees. You know, he sounds like a bagpipe with asthma breathing, you know, <gasps> you know from that, that, that swim. And he says, no, that's not what I want. And he said, oh, he, he says, you, you want my throne after I'm gone. He said, no, he said, not, that's not what I want either. He said, oh, I know you want my daughter's hand in marriage because then you get the kingdom and the property and everything. He goes, no. He said, that's, that's not what I want either. He said, good night, son. What is it you could possibly want? He said, I want the guy that pushed me in. <laughs> we get into the ministry for some time and we want to know who pushed us in. How did we get in this far and this deep or whatever the case may be? So Psalm 44, would you stand with me? I'm going to read from verse 1 down through verse 8. I'll ask you to follow along with me as I read aloud, if you would, please. I may have you keep standing the balance of it because you just had a sumptuous meal. <laughs> you know, I know how that is. And these, I, I, they used to in churches have wood pews. And boy, I'll tell you that, they kept me awake. But now they got four inches of padded <laughs> chairs or pews or whatever, and very comfortable. Uh, follow along with me as I read aloud from verse 1 down through verse 8 on Psalm 44 and verse 1. 
We have heard with our ears, our God, our Father hath, O God, our Father hath told us what work thou didst in their day, days and the times of old. How thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them. How thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arms save them. But thy right hand and thine arm and thy, the light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor uh, unto them. Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. Selah. And let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, I pray that you'd bless and help us tonight. Lord, we're on the eve of a great task before us. Not that physically we're incapable of doing it, but Lord, we, we cannot do it spiritually without your help. All the effort that goes into the next couple days to try to bring light to the capital is based on our spiritual well-being and that they might see something different in us. Not just something that is given, though a wonderful possession, but the fact is that they know that you've been in that place with us. And so, Lord, we trust that through the course of this night and tomorrow, may our hearts certainly look heavenward. We've heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us of what you've done for our ancestors in the formation of this country. And Lord, it's our generation now, and I pray that you'd bless and help us. In Christ's name, amen. You may have a seat. We are certainly a, a, a pr very prosperous nation, and we have been blessed. And oftentimes we call to record the fact of what has happened in our country, that it was established under Christian principles, and that we look back through the annals of history and we see repeatedly uh, the references to the Almighty and uh, what He provided for us, and even the experience that they, our country has had, even when we think of the revolution. It's amazing. In December of 1777, Washington with 11,000 soldiers went into Valley Forge that September or close to it, September, October. There was um, General Howe had taken Philadelphia and they'd all fled the capital city, Philadelphia being the capital. He thought if I take the capital, then obviously that nation will relinquish its power because we took the capital. Well, ours was a transient, a transient capital as far as that. And so everybody left town and they came in and took Philadelphia. And not far in Valley Forge, Washington with his troops in December, uh, they endured the winter there, 11,000 of them. If you ever read the account of it, it was amazing what they suffered in that. At one time he said, we have some 2,800 personnel that are capable uh, of any kind of engagement. There were 11,000 in Valley Forge and at that time there were 11,000 prisoners uh, patriots, Americans, there were aboard uh, prisoner ships, five of them, out on the, on the ocean, and many of them died of starvation out on those. It was our country. They were digging a well that we might be able to drink from, when you think about it. And of course, they finally made their way out of Valley Forge, and uh, they paid a great price. But even in the midst of all that and how God preserved them, I'm thinking of the fact of Prior to that, in the f few months before, what took place was um, General Sir, uh, Burgoyne, Sir Goyne, Sir Goyne, uh, General Burgoyne was coming down from Canada to battle in Albany. General Howe, the British, was supposed to come up from New York and come to Albany and help him to battle and take Albany, which would have certainly uh, caused a great deal of difficulty in our, you know, our, our formation of our nation. There was a General um, Jeter who was coming in from the uh, from the west. And he got stopped at Oriskany, and he, and, he, and he lost a bloody battle, the English did, in Oriskany. And because Howe didn't come up and meet those that were coming down, some 6,000 British prisoners were taken captive that fall. I mean, it was, in a sense, a miracle 
by the very mistakes that our enemy made. You see, there were 60,000 English soldiers on U.S. soil at that time, or American solar, so, uh, soil. And there were 80 ships and 22,000 sailors that were in the Atlantic, British. So we were against the, the largest force. And yet, what we, we saw and we read about is amazing. But the same courage they may have had and desire they had, we need to have in our generation. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis, the 26th chapter. I think that one of the greatest illustrations for our, us as a nation, and especially in our day and age, is to come to the place that we must realize that we have had, we've had the opportunity to drink from the wells that they've dug, but it comes to a day and age where we again must dig those wells like Isaac did in our day and age. Look, if you will, to Genesis, the 26th chapter. Now, the purpose of this whole thing, of God allowing them apparently to come into this situation we'll read about in the 26th chapter is in verse 28, because Abimelech took notice, if you look in verse 28 of the 26th chapter, let me just turn over a page here to get there. In verse 28, it says this, and they said, we, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. You know, it's amazing. When we get under a great deal of stress and difficulty in our lives, what, if anything, it causes us to radiate a greater light for the Lord Jesus Christ if we yield to him. You know, you, as you know, you go to a jewelry store and they have the beautiful diamonds and they have a backdrop of black. Why? So that diamond stands out so much greater, or the, you know, the stars are always in the sky, but it's the blackness of night that makes them stand out. And it's the same thing. It's not because of a, a flowery bed of ease that we may live our lives. It's the fact that sometimes we realize there's going to be opposition. Do you know during the Revolutionary War, there were some only 25% of those that resided in America that were helpful in the Revolution? 25%. How many times do we think, well, if just people would get involved? It's not people, it's ourselves that get involved into whatever number we can because one in a situation with God on their side is a majority. Yeah. So going down tomorrow, it's not a matter of, well, we're coming in there with a peace offering. No, no, we're God's people coming before those that we have appointed or elected to represent us and to serve us in some capacity. And we want to pray for you and we want to give to you something that is a well that our forefathers dug back in 1786, 7? 82. Huh? Uh, 82? 82, yeah. yeah I, I was right decade. Close. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't born yet. Shortly thereafter, <laughs> um, as far as that. But I know it was that decade. But the fact is, is to, to have that Bible printed so that people can have a copy of God's Word. The thing is, we need to dig that well again. So that, just like Abimelech said, we certainly saw that the Lord was with you. When it's all said and done, it's that, like that song, I saw Jesus in you. That's the difference. May the name of Tim Young rot and die. May Jesus' name be lifted up. That's the way we live our lives, no doubt. So the illustration's there. And so the purpose was certainly the idea of we certainly, uh, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee, is Abimelech's testimony. We often think that believers are not supposed to have any tribulations or any difficulties that come into their life. That's not true. Not that we would try to create them or go out and look for them, but they'll come to us if we live our Christian faith. And we stand for that which is right. So we have to be careful. We don't think we're supposed to be exempt from them. But we're supposed to have strength and courage to endure them. Most people, Christians, believe that the purpose of the church is to make me happy. The purpose of my family in marriage is to make me happy. And the purpose of government is to make me happy. It's all about us being happy. But that's not why God created the family, nor the church, nor government. That's right. Not to make us happy. He created certainly the family so we could procreate, have families and so forth. And certainly the church to minister and to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ and a civil government where we might have the opportunity to do that 
in a, an environment that's conducive to propagating the gospel. If you were to take the gospel in other countries that do not have what we have enjoyed as far as propagating the gospel, you'd find out very readily that to propagate any gospel or any belief religiously is a violation of their law. And just because we're an American and just because, well, in our country, we have that freedom to do that is because somebody dug a well and it's being filled up <laughs> and we have to redig that well. And we have great privileges that we enjoy. We have to always be mindful of the purpose of the church is not to make us happy, but to coordinate us in such a fashion we go out and reach the gospel to the people around the surrounding area to be a light. That's the purpose of the church. Well, I'm not happy. We don't have enough socials. And how many times are we going to have any dinners this year? <laughs> I mean, it's not about that. And can we play volleyball? There's nothing wrong with volleyball. But the sole purpose of the church is to propagate the gospel collectively so we can do it in a greater force and reach our areas, no doubt about it. And government is to give us the privilege and the freedom to be able to do that. See, we desire to live on the work or the wells of previous generations, but that's not what we're to do. We'd like to be able to do that, but we have to dig our own wells. Washington dug a well. In the years that he served this country, it cost him a great deal. And the fact of those that suffered and lost loved ones. In fact, you know, there were 500 women that died in Valley Forge. Because many times the women or families would follow the troops and go there to help, whether wash clothes or provide meals or whatever the case may be. But some 500 women died in Valley Forge that were there to help the armed forces. They, they were digging well for us to drink from someday. And we take it for granted. We have to certainly be careful. Even when they dug the wells again of Abraham, there was strife. If you follow down this story, and we'll read portions of it, there was a famine in the land. Not the one of hearing God's word. It was actually a physical famine. But I think in our day and age, we see a spiritual famine of hearing God's word. And so they were going to, Isaac was going to go down to Egypt. And the Lord said, no, in verse 1, he said, stay in the land. This is the land I've given you, you and this is the land you're going to stay in. So he went over near Gera. And that's obviously where Abimelech and his, um, the uh, Palestines, uh, Pal Palestinians were. And the fact is, is they went in it at first. And of course, Isaac did the same thing that his father did. Uh, she's my sister uh, situation. If I ever said that to my wife, I'd have a black eye. <laughs> but he did. Now, I'll be married 50 years this coming May. And you know what's really amazing? My wife has been married 50 years. <laughs> I never thought that was possible for me anyway, as far as that. I'm just saying, uh, the thing is, is obviously that was the wrong thing. But God wanted to use him because he was part of the lineage of Abraham. And now he's going to dig the wells again that Abraham dug. Because in Bible days, if you dug a well and there was water there, basically you owned the land. Because from there, you can grow crops, you can feed your livestock and everything. I mean, it became a, a, a center of, of the universe to you because there was water. And so the Philistines had filled in the, the, the wells because they were not a big and prosperous nation. And they didn't want anybody to move into their, the, you know, into their neighborhood. And so they filled those, those wells of Abraham. So the Lord's instruction, obviously, was first of all, look, if you will, to verse 2 and 3 in Genesis, the 26th chapter. It says, and the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all this countries, these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So he said, I don't want you to leave the land. Many times what we find ourselves doing and we see people doing is, is removing themselves or transporting themselves, even as Christians, to another location, another area. And they do it based on a lot of situations, circumstances, when in fact it ought to be God moving you from one place to another. 
Stay in the land. This is where you happen to be. This is your state of domicile. And so it's yours. So, well, you know, we're going to move someday. But today you're here. And make sure that any move that you have is that which is going to ordain, be ordained of the Lord. Because you want to be in the right place, not in the wrong place. But the idea is, is stay in the land. We think somehow it'll be easier to live our Christian life in a different location. When in fact, God may have raised you up for this location. Amen. Right. To serve the Lord and be a voice where you are, not where you're not. And Colorado needs it. New York needs it. New York is in trouble as far as that. I ran for the New York State Senate in 2014. I want you to know I didn't win. Um, <laughs> but, but I met a lot of wonderful people as I traveled to the various different hamlets and towns of that district. There were three full counties and three partial counties. It was a big area. And so I went to all these towns and all the town meetings, all the question and answer and everything else. And many of them would say, listen, pastor, they always called me pastor, you know, pastor. When they introduced me in these big meetings, they'd say, Pastor Young is here, and I, which is fine. Uh, that was my handle um, as far as what I did for a living. But the thing is, is that it was an opportunity to meet some good people out there that said, listen, you need to stay in this thing. Don't move out of this thing. There are some people that do believe like we do that are not of us. I'm not saying we ought to go out and solicit them, but there's some people that are conservative. On the aircraft coming from Rochester to Chicago, there was a lady, she sat uh, adjacent to me. There was just two seats on that side, and so I always talk to whoever I'm with, give the gospel to them. I don't start out with that. And Are you going home? You, this is Rochester, your home. And she said, no, I grew up in Rochester, went and visited my mother. She had an 85th birthday, and I'm going back. We live west of Chicago. My husband works in Chicago, and we started talking. And uh, her, uh, and we started, I don't even know how the subject came up, but said something about run, running, you know, running. And, um, she, uh, and she said that her husband runs marathons. But he never trains for him. He does an elliptical, and then every once in a while he'll go on a Saturday and go run a, that's 26.2 miles. I get tired driving that far. <laughs> now, to tell you the truth, I run a lot of races. I've run 5Ks, 10Ks. Next month I'll run a five-mile race. May I'm running an ultra marathon. My secret is I run to the nearest road and hitchhike <laughs> to the finish line. Works every time. But see, at 72, I'll be 73 this year. What it is is this, is I can, I can beat most of the people in my age group. <laughs> you know, so I feel successful, you know, as far as that. What I do is I really find, when I'm running like that, I, I find a well-upholstered person and, and try to beat them. <laughs> you know, that's all, you know. Um, but I'm just saying, in, talk, in talking, the fact is, I said, we said, what are you doing? I'm going to Denver, and I'm going to be speaking there and working in the capital of getting some Bibles in the, you know, of course, there are people's eyes kind of go like that when, you, when they start talking about the Bible and stuff like that. But when I talked to her, she said, well, our three children are in a parochial school because we felt like we didn't want to put them in a pu public situation. Now, she was Catholic, and we don't want to put them in a, a public school. And that's why I went on about saying, because you like to have some control over what they're taught socially and everything else and not have it taken away by a school system. Now, I said, now that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to help make that so that they go back to education rather than social engineering and changing the kids and their philosophies as far as that. And so, I mean, it was amazing. She said, you know, I, I agree with that. that I, I believe it wholeheartedly. But so there's people out. Not that we're going soliciting, but you'll find out that there are other people that are similar to us in that way. So when we think about the well that we've, we've had participated in, we've been blessed unbelievably. Look, if you will, to verse 15. It says this. Um, oh, i got to turn a page here again. Verse 15 says this. It says, for all the wells which... His father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. The Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. 
So while he dug the wells, Abraham did, to feed his flocks, and because he, in the 20th chapter of Genesis, had actually another famine, but God didn't want him to go back to Egypt. He went down to Gerah as well, and that's why he dug those wells. And 100 years later, Isaac's going back there and digging the same wells because they'd been stopped up. Your Christian schools, your colleges, your bus routes, your you know, teaching uh, children in absence of their parents, and all those things that the government is trying to take away from us is filling those wells that had been dug. I can remember getting saved in the early 70s in a number of Christian schools that were um, being raised up in many churches across this land. And you know the court cases that have taken place in many of them and how that they've been basically, you know, laws have been passed to put them out of existence. And the public arena is always trying to destroy them. Those were wells that were dug by people that paid the price and moms and dads that paid tuition and, and those that maybe taught and worked in the school free so it could be done. And they dug that well. Sometimes we got to get back and dig the same well back again because it's being filled up. And that's what Isaac did. He had to dig the same wells that his father had dug one time or his servants had so that he could provide for his family and do those things that were obviously right. Look, if you will, to verse 18. It says, And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had uh, digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called uh, their names after the names by which his father had called them. So they dug the wells, and as they dug the wells, Abimelech and that uh, the Philistines got angry towards Isaac because what happened was God started blessing Isaac, started planting cro crops, and they came back a hundredfold. His, crop, his uh, livestock um, grew as far as numbers and everything. He became far greater than them. And so as a result, that's why in verse 28, he said, we, we certainly have seen that the Lord is with you because they were trying to do everything they could to stop him. He said, get out of here. Keep moving out of here. And so they kept moving in that valley of Gira and digging those wells. But I want you to notice something that, 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 that happened here. Look in verse 22. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us. And we shall be fruitful in the land. To me, it, I don't believe in replacement, the fact that church, as far as that, I'm just saying the thing is, is people have dug wells, and the thing is, it's time for you and I to dig some, dig, redig those wells, but maybe dig some of our own wells. In the, from my understanding, in, you know, in 50s and 60s and even 70s, my experience, the church was not real involved. And I'm not talking about being in politics, but you are citizens of this country, and we have an obligation before God and before our fellow man to be instrumental in trying to cause liberty to reign in this society rather than, obviously, this Dragonian laws that they have of control. Just think what's taking place. Do you remember when the phones were attached to the wall? And the biggest, biggest and most fun thing is when you could buy an extension cord that was extra long, and you'd, you could go in three rooms, go in the closet, go upstairs, you know, the thing, curly thing. But the only thing, by the time you got it back to the wall, it was, you know, it was knotted up and everything. And then they got, that, you, now you young people are going to have to go to the museum to see that, okay? Um, and then they had the ones where it was actually, uh, you didn't have a cord attached to it. It was like a miracle. You know what we're at now? They know where everybody is. <laughs> they any time. I mean, we are starting to get this surface as far as that, of what's going on in our society, is how they're overseeing so much of what's taking place. The one that blew me away is when, what, what was that little thing that was, um, you get a little, and you say, uh, what's the temperature in Denver? It was a little apparatus there. Alexis, okay. Is that always Alexis? Okay. You say, Alexis, uh, you know what's temperature in Denver and everything. And I remember uh, one time sitting with a, uh, with a family, and they were talking, my wife and I were, and they were talking about couches, you know, sectional couches or whatever the case may be. The next thing, the guy that owned the house that we happened to be visiting in, that had Alexis sitting there, the next thing you know, 
he gets ads from things about couches. <laughs> you know, and that was years ago. <laughs> so I can't even imagine what they, you know, people say, oh, they'll never ever know. They already know. We're living in strange times. But the fact is, is so we may have to dig some new wells that they never knew anything about. And God will make room for us, just like he made room for those that were before us. We think of our forefathers in the faith. We think of those who through the years have built churches and colleges and so forth. Some are still there. Some are gone. Some are you know, in the annals of history only. And the fact is, then we think of our country and the freedoms. We think of Washington. We think of all them. Jefferson. We think of all Madison. John Leland. Nobody, very few people know about you know, Baptist preacher in Orange County, Virginia, you know, that was going to run for the, um, uh, they, were, they were going to uh, vote in the, ratify the Constitution in Virginia. And, and he was going to run so he could be there to see if he could get some, you know, Bill of Rights or rights for the people. And first of all and foremost, religious rights. James Madison, who is known as the, the, the father of thereof, the fact is, is he met with them. He came to Leland's home. He said to his wife, said, where's your husband? He said, well, he's down in that grove over there, down there a ways. He's in there having a prayer meeting with, with him and the Lord. So he went down there to meet him. And after a discussion, it was given the idea that once we get the Constitution ratified, then we will have a Bill of Rights. And the thing is, is we do have that freedom of religion that's handed. That's the thing that holds the government back from what we have the privilege of doing. So we, we've, we've enjoyed their wells, and now we're talking about redigging them, and I'm for that. We need to dig those wells again, but also we need to dig some new ones because we have a different world. Some of these things we need to try to move away from. Think how much TV is watched by God's people in comparison to their Bible reading. Think how many parents have a TV for a babysitter and don't have devotions with their kids. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about those other people. And how fast we are. We're all... Have you ever left home and forgot your cell phone? I can guarantee you I know what you did. Turn around, went back, got it. <laughs> okay, I can't leave home. Do you remember when you used to go on vacation for two weeks and the phone was on the wall at home? <laughs> and there wasn't an answering machine? You had no idea who called. It is important, they'll call you when you get home. But now, now people in the middle of the night, somebody texts somebody or whatever, they'll spend the rest of the night in conversation. And we used to say, those teenagers do that. One time I was preaching in, in, in Pennsylvania, and a good friend, uh, Brian Corner, and I, I preached at his church. We went out and get a bite to eat after church Sunday night. And I walked in, we walked in, and in, in this booth, before the one we were going to get in, there was a, a, a man and a woman, and they both were uh, white haired. I mean, they were not, you know, they're probably in their 60s or whatever. And one sitting on one side of the table and texting, and the man sitting on the other side texting, and not to each other. So I stopped and I said, you look like a couple of teenagers here. They laughed. I mean, we had a good time. We had a chance to witness to them and everything. They got caught red-handed, you know. I mean, it's not just the teenagers. How many, how many have almost run over somebody talking on a phone or texting on a phone? You know, was it, was it you today we did that? Oh, when pulling in the church parking lot. The lady comes on the sidewalk. <laughs> You know, what they need to do is put one of these blinking lights on people's heads, you know, when they're doing that so people can, you know, see around them. I think we need to have enough Christianity to be busy about the Lord's work because we need to dig some wells. Now, my generation, perhaps, I'm not saying we're over the hill. We can see it from where we are. But the thing is, we're not over the hill. But the fact is, is there's a generation coming up that needs to realize they need to get out the shovels and dig some wells, some that have already been dug, and maybe some for themselves, for the cause of Christ, or what will we have in, in the years to come, or the weeks or months to come, the way things are going. 
I was preaching in Albany years ago, and there was a, a, a blind man and blind wife sitting on the front row, and they had a German shepherd as a uh, seeing eye dog. When I got done preaching, the pastor come up and he said, Brother Young, did you see that, that couple there, the blind couple on the front row? And I said, sure did. He said, do you know that that blind couple led 150 people to the Lord last year? I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, they probably do the phone ministry where they go, eh, 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 and you know, just get a bunch of numbers. And somebody answers and say, oh, don't hang up, I just want to visit with you. And maybe witnesses on the phone. I said, well, how do they do it? He said, we well, see the dog, he said, he said, that seeing-eyed dog is trained as they, it leads them down the road to go around telephone poles or maybe around other people and, you know, moves them one way or the other as they go down the, the road. He said, they retrained that dog. They retrained that dog so that if somebody's coming towards them, that that dog bird dogs them. So you're walking down the road or street, and all of a sudden this German shepherd's coming, so you get over the side while the German shepherd gets over the side. Then you move over here thinking you get out of the way, and the German shepherd comes over here, and by the time you both meet, you're up against the brick wall of a store like this with a German shepherd with his teeth hanging out, sitting on his haunches going like that. And, the, these, <laughs> and these two blind people would go... Do you, do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? <laughs> you know, you got this German shepherd sitting right there. I said, well, it probably works, you know, as far as that. Now, they have more Christianity than we do. You know, the dog does. We need to dig some wells. We need to be challenged in our Christian life to realize that our forefathers have paid such a dear price when they, we've provide, they provided for us some wonderful drink from those wells, but they've been stuffed up. You, you go to a legislator and you try to tell them about the history of America. I, know, I, heard, I heard that. Or they'll say, really? <laughs> they have no idea that that happened. And that's what's happened in the public sector. What they're doing is they're destroying history. Because if you take away somebody's history, it's like somebody that has amnesia, that doesn't know who they are, where they came from, who they're associated with, anything about their life. The only thing they have is going forward. And America is getting amnesia. And the church is getting amnesia. We're forgetting where we came from. Those that built this church in whatever year, somebody came with a call of God on their life and said, you know what, there's people in that area that need Jesus. <laughs> uh, when I, we started a church in Palmyra, New York, Joe Smith, Joseph Smith started Mormonism in Palmyra. He lost those gold tablets. I went to Palmyra in 1980 looking for the gold tablets. Gold was up. Now, I never did find any gold. I found up some wonderful jewels that Malachi talks about, making up his jewels, you know, as far as that. But the thing is, is I work laying block uh, as far as 40 hours a week and went so in at night and on Saturday. I'm not talking and just, you know, to be, I'm the perfect example. For, I'm just saying there was reckless abandonment. Now it's like, okay, uh, uh, I'm applying for the CEO of that church. <laughs> You know? And I'm wondering what the benefit package is, and I wonder what the retirement package is, and I wonder, you know, and, how the, and I'm not against all the things that churches care, and they should care for their pastor. That's Bible. But we got to get back to the reckless abandonment. And when we do, what we do is we start digging our own, some wells that we can drink from and our kids can drink from. I think it's important for us to understand that. I'm thinking of Brother Armstrong. I mean, he's, he's in it. <laughs> you know, count me in, <laughs> you know. What are we fighting for anyway? I just, I just like a good fight. <laughs> I'm just saying the thing is, is we need, to, we need to realize we have that before us. It took work to redig those wells. It took work. I remember hearing Lester Roloff saying, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a war and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. Now, I can't sing it like he did. I don't think anybody could sing like he could. But uh, the fact is, I mean, that's where he was. He was all in, all in. And that's the kind of life we ought to have. It takes work. In redigging, Isaac opened a new well. And then, of course, the Bible says that the Lord made room for him. He'll make room for us. We wonder how it's going to happen. We wonder what's going to take place. The thing is, the Lord will make the room. 
you men that have started churches or started ministries someplace, people around you said, how in the world are they ever expecting to make that happen? They're not. They're expecting God to make it happen. They just want to be an instrument in His hand. See, we're not kingdom building other than His kingdom. Pastors are not supposed to be kingdom builders of, for themselves. They're supposed to be that kind of kingdom builder. As far as that, wherever he chooses for us to do it and do it in the way he wants and dig the wells so our children can drink from them. And one day when somebody tries, tries to stop up and fill up our, the wells that we dug for them, then somebody needs to be there with a spade ready to dig them up again. Rather than saying, I can't believe it. Then they realize this is a Christian nation. It was influenced by Christians in the Bible. And the Bible was revered. And look at our Constitution and look at our uh, Declaration of Independence. I, I know that. But they look at you like a calf looks at an open gate for the first time. You know, what are you talking about? So we need to be digging wells, not just getting to the next week or getting to the next family, but dig some wells so that young people have an opportunity to drink from them and we can drink from them. And tomorrow what you're doing is you're going in and you're, saying, you're establishing yourself as a presence, not to argue, not to be a complainer, not to be somebody that's going to tell them where the bear went through the buckwheat, if it did go through the buckwheat. The fact is you're there because you're mindful of the fact that there are servants. Amen. We're king in America, the citizen is unlike any other country in the world. We're the king of, by, and for the people. We should be sure we don't miss that. In 19, or seven, excuse me, 1776, in the earlier part of that year, there was a pastor down in the Virginia. You perhaps remember the name John Peter Mullenberg. John Peter Mullenberg was a pastor. Now, he had had some experience in, while he was in Germany. He was a Lutheran pastor, but uh, he would had some uh, experience in the military. And when he saw what was taking place in America, he one day took off his robe after preaching, and he took off his robe, and under it he had a colonel's uniform of the Continental Army. And he rallied the men, and not only men in his church, but men in the area, some 300 of them joined with him. And Washington later made him a general, but the fact is he was amazed at this preacher because of his willingness to stand when it was time to stand and do what was right. Now, J John Peter Mullenberg had a brother, Frederick, who pastored a Lutheran church in New York City. He wrote to his brother about getting involved in what's taking place as far as our freedom. Frederick says, wait a minute, that's carnal, I'm going to stick with the spiritual, you have an obligation to stick with the spiritual, and not the carnal, basically. And so his brother called him, you know, basically wrote back and said, then you're for England. Well, Frederick went on and did his job until the British came into New York and they bombed and burned his church. <laughs> you know what Frederick did? He joined the, the army <laughs> and fought against them. And both of those brothers, what's amazing, they said, hey, freedom's worth it. Those, both those brothers became instrumental in the formation of our government, became U.S. senators and individuals that were influential in our government, in the form of government, but they were churchmen, if you please. This, wait a minute, it's time for us to be involved. I don't think we need a revolution. I, need, I think we need a resolution that we resolve ourselves to do something with our life. Amen. Have you ever been to Valley Forge? You ever been to Oriskany? You ever been to some of these places where the blood of those patriots that happened to dig the freedom that we enjoyed? I'm not saying that's what we have to do. But we have to be careful we're not such fair-weather Christians that we expect somebody to do it for us. And it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Look back, if you will, to Psalm 44. I'll conclude with that. Psalm 44 reminds us again. I, being saved at a young age and 
then for whatever reason, the Lord allowed me to sit under the preaching of some of what we would call the greats of yesteryear. Unbelievable. Now in retrospect, looking back, I thought, wow, I sat at and listen to that person preach several times. And some of them I preached with. And the thing is, is that it was amazing to look back because what they did, what they built in their generation, what they were willing to do. And even before, verse 1, Psalm 44, we have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us. Our fathers have told us what it, what it is. And then it goes on, it says, um, what work thou didst in their days in the times of old. I want the Lord to do something today. I've lived like a devil. I'm going to die like a man. And I want to die serving the Lord. And that ought to be your desire. As long as the Lord gives you the capabilities and the ability to do it, you want to serve the Lord. Because it's worth it. Many of you have grandchildren. I have ten, n- number 10 is coming within three weeks. It's a girl. I got a girl on the front end and a girl on the back. One's called engine, the other's called caboose. Um, and boys in between. And the thing is, is not just for them, but for him. So that they might have some wells to drink from. That's why we're busy. That's why it's not time to stop. George Washington gave his life for this country. When he resigned his commission, went back to Mount Vernon, they said, you know what? We need a leader. We want you to lead it. Your Excellency, I'm not going to be Your Excellency. (laughs) Okay, President, okay. And then so willingly handed it off. That's what it's really all about, not controlling it or keeping it. The world was amazed that George Washington, who had the army that could keep his control for as long as he wanted it in this nation, was whether to relinquish it. The rest of the world was baffled because that's not the way it's done. But it is here. Let me encourage you, dig some wells. Let's dig a well tomorrow. It doesn't mean we're going to mock the idea of digging a well. But the thing is, you start somewhere. You get your pickaxe and your shovel and you just start somewhere. And you'll hit water. Because the Lord will make room for us when we dig some new wells.